But yeah, perhaps we can start with just a high level overview on uh, what Banny is uh, for people who are getting the download. And then I got some follow up questions for you. All right. So uh, in the late 80s, the US Army War College uh, came up with this uh, way of looking at a volatile environment. They called it the VUCA framework. VUCA standing for, as many of you probably know, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, a way of describing you know, what they felt uh, was the way of their best way of characterizing the world that, that they were in. And over the years, that, that seemed to map pretty nicely to the end of the Cold War, the emergence of the internet era. It was a useful tool and, biz, you know, like any good, useful, somewhat generic military tool, the business consultant world picked it right up. And uh, so it's been, you know, a part of the business consultant conversation and maybe more broadly the the analyst conversation for quite some time and at these at this point in some actually around 2016 2017 i started to feel like god vuca you know we eat vuca for breakfast these days it is really you know it's everywhere and you know, just like a fish swimming in water can't really identify the water, it's hard to really spot the VUCA when it's all VUCA, where everything is VUCA. And so I started to think through what the different possible alternatives would be. And at the same time, I got asked to do a talk about anarchy and chaos in, a, in the global political context. And it all sort of started to come together. So in late 2018, I delivered a, a talk for the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California, on this, the balance between chaos and anarchy, and introduced there this, this Bani framework as a way of moving beyond VUCA, but to really capture not just the, the descriptions of a chaotic world, but the feelings of a chaotic world. Because one of the things I've been doing futures work, foresight work for God, over 25 years at this point. And one of the lessons that I have learned from this is that humans are, are the first thing to look at. It's so, it's so easy for futurists and people in that broad cloud of, of professions to look at technology first, to look at big driving forces. And the reality is that human human behavior, human feelings, human thoughts need to be at the focus of our work. So it was important for me to look at Banny really as this context of what does it feel like to live in this world of chaos? And it got a moderate response from the people at IFTF and I kept playing with it. And in 2020, March of 2020, I just tossed up an essay on um, Medium with the uh, the original description of of Banny and what it meant and what it means going forward and it has taken off so well peter do you want me to sort of dive into the meaning of Banny uh, or both in the definitional and and metaphorical sense or do you want me to go towards the you know what's happening with it right now yeah yeah it would be good to get like a definitional like kind of rocking what it is okay. and then the impact of it, that'd be cool. All right. So Bani, uh, which, by the way, is the old Norse word for death, completely coincidental. Um, Bani stands for, as Peter suggested earlier, brittle, anxious, or anxiety-inducing, nonlinear, and incomprehensible. And is a, for me, I see this as a way of giving, giving a name to the somewhat uh, the sometimes inchoate feelings of wah that we all have around the era that we're in right now. You know, brittle in this particular context, in particular, is not is not identical to fragile, but brittle means something that is strong, appears strong, acts like it's strong, and when it breaks, it shatters. It doesn't bend. It breaks and it just completely falls apart, often without much in the way of warning. So brittle systems are things that we have been working with for years, decades, and we have considered them to be a strong part of our, our society, our civilization. And then when they break, they break hard. And we're seeing that, I, I think, most notably with democracy, where 
if you if you go back and you look at the uh, the books around political science, and I, I did my graduate work in political science uh, years ago. Um, if you go back and look, you can see there's a lot of, an, there's a great assumption that democracy is a stable system. And what we have learned over the past five years is that it's not. That in fact, bro democracy can be broken and broken hard fairly easily if you know where the pressure points are. Uh, we can see a similar kind of uh, of issue around a lot of the the big global systems. Our energy system is shattering, uh, in part because it's in a transition. Um, you know, we we see how how brittle global trade has been. You know, this. I mean, we're still deep into this um, supply chain. You know, supply chain bottleneck. It, isn't it funny, by the way, just how the term supply chain has gone from economist jargon to everyday discussion. Anyway, so brittle is a sense of everything is so easily on the verge of just collapsing, and it's very hard to tell what will go next. Anxious or anxiety inducing it originally came for me just from reading of all places Reddit and looking at posts from people who are in their late teens and in their 20s and 30s about their feelings of being alive right now, of just how much anxiety there is about the world among people who should be, you know, should be at the, the prime of their life, should be at the point where they're having the most fun, having the most options. And I started to see anxiety as this, this sense that there are no good options. All of our choices are bad ones. And they start to see all over the place this feeling or these people responding to the world with this horrified sense of there's nothing we can do, not in a defeatist sense, but in a I don't know what to do kind of sense. Uh, the one way I described it uh, in the original talk was that it's that feeling that you get when you pass, you, know, you pass your exit and you realize there's not an, a, another exit for 100 miles. You know, it's that sense of I have, I don't know what to do now, and things are things are not working right. And so this anxiety or uh, anxiety inducing uh, part, element of our chaos is this is really the deepest of the the feeling components, but really is this this component of it that says we don't know what to do. It, it's just, it's not that there are too many options, it's that there are too many bad options. The good options are hard to find, and when they exist, we often find they have their own kinds of bad consequences. Nonlinear is the most direct connection to chaos in the traditional mathematics sense, but is this, this idea that uh, many of the crises that we're facing now have a nonlinear component where inputs and outputs are, are disproportionate or disconnected over time. One, one of the big examples I, up until very recently, have been using is the hysteretic aspect of climate change. Uh, it's understood that there is a lag, a fairly long lag between the introduction of carbon and carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and warming temperatures to a point where uh, the, con the consensus had been by the IPCC that we would see at least 20 to 30, possibly as much as 50 years of additional warming, not just maintained temperatures, but continued, continued warming, even if we stopped putting any greenhouse gases into the atmosphere immediately, right this very second. We stop right now, we would still see you know, and, and according to the IPCC, we would still see another generation's worth of warming. And to me, for me, that struck me not just as a geophysical issue, an environmental issue, which of course it is, but a political issue as well. Because what happens when you convince people to make drastic and dramatic changes to their ways of life? Because at this point, all the easy, our options for easy choices are that we, we gave that up decade ago, decade or two ago. You ask people to make dramatic choices and changes to their way of life, and then nothing happens. Nothing gets better. And that goes on for 
your entire adulthood. About a month ago, um, Michael Mann, who was the, the uh, environmental scientist behind the, the hockey stick graph, um, he published some pieces uh, really pointing out a bit of research that really had gone unnoticed, including by the IPCC, that in fact, th the strongest evidence is that the hysteretic lag is only about five years. Which, on the one hand, I was kind of disappointed because I lost a great example, but <laughs> on the other, it's this is incredibly good news because it, we won't have that kind of political crisis. But still, there is this hysteretic lag, this nonlinear lag between inputs and outputs, just happens to be a bit shorter. But we see nonlinear effects, uh, exponential effects in particular around pandemics. Uh, it's actually fairly common in natural systems. And the human brain isn't really good at accounting for that. We're pretty good at, at understanding linear effects, linear cause and effect, if then kind of situations. We're not quite as good at really understanding and being able to map out ahead of time the exponential and nonlinear non systems. And then incomprehensible. Incomprehensible is one I would get the most pushback about from other people. Uh, because, hey, we're, we're smart. We're human beings in the 21st century. Nothing is truly permanently incomprehensible, right? That may well be true, but that's kind of not the point. You know, when I talk about incomprehensible, I mean, systems that we think we should be able to understand that don't make sense. You know, the, the example that I love to use that I don't know how many of you in, in listening here are uh, programmers, but every single programmer I've ever spoken with has told me, has related the story of um, a bit of code that they, they fully believe does nothing in their overall program. And so they remove it and the program won't compile. But as soon as they put the useless code back in, the program compiles fine. And you know, like I said, I've not, this is not just a one-off. I've heard this from every, pretty much every programmer I've talked to. And for me, that's like the, the, the prime example, the chef's kiss example of incomprehensible. I should understand this. We should be able to understand this, but it makes no sense. I have, you know, I usually point to issues around machine learning and artificial intelligence, where the conclusions reached by truly complex, these truly complex uh, adaptive AI systems don't make any sense, or we don't understand how we got, how they, how those machines got to where they got, um, which is a particular problem because laws have been passed in the European Union that will soon require companies to be able to explain why their AIs have come up with certain decisions that they then implement into the market. So that's a little thing. But I also have sort of expanded out this concept of incomprehensible to really look at, well, so we have a bunch of human behaviors that are incomprehensible. And why do people believe in the QAnon stuff? Why are people so stridently anti-vaccine? Is this it's ridiculous and incomprehensible? You know, why do people behave in truly horrific ways? It's senseless and incomprehensible. And then we are once again feeling very acutely the, um, the threat of nuclear weapons, you know, which never really went away, but this last year has made it to, has brought, their atten brought our attention back to them. And a gentleman by the name of Herman Kahn wrote a book in the 1960s on thermonuclear warfare, which was about thinking the unthinkable. And for me, that's the last, that's the, the final kind of, of incomprehensible, the, the unthinkable. Uh, so all of these, these are, these are lenses through which to look at the world around us and say, okay, well, what is this you know, chaotic thing happening? What, how can we define, how can we describe it what language can we use to explore it? Moreover, it serves as a platform for which to think through, well, what, how do we react to things? How do we respond to these kinds of situations? You know, we respond to brittleness with an emphasis on resilience and preparedness and, you know, a, a anti-fragility in um, uh, 
uh, Nicholas Nassim, Nassim's language. Um, the example that I love to give around this is that it's my understanding, I live in California, I've lived in California my whole life, so earthquakes are on the top of my, are always there for me, that's something to think about. Hey, Douglas, um, what I, ha I have learned that a number of the, a lot of the companies in California that had basically built out a good earthquake plan, you know, what do we, what do, we do as an organization if a big earthquake, if the big one hits, and we can't go into the office for an extended period of time. How do we continue our operations? A lot of those companies were able to translate their earthquake plans to their pan, uh, pandemic plans. Basically, people, the companies, the organizations, and many, in many respects, the people who had already thought through and prepared themselves for one kind of chaos or one kind of, of chaotic event were actually able to be ready, be better prepared for this other kind. Uh, this resilience, this concept of, of slack, of being able to have a cushion in your, you know, in your preparedness, in your supplies, in your well-being, something where you can take the hit and actually keep going. Um, anxiety is the other one that really, that I think there's a strong uh, counter to, and that is you know, the role of empathy frankly, kindness. I am a great believer in the importance of human empathy in our, in, in our interactions, both at the day-to-day -day and at the systemic level. The, the understanding and the recognition of a shared humanity. And that all sounds very hippy-dippy, I recognize. But having done this for quite some time, having worked around the world and work with big organizations and neighborhood organizations and you know the full range of scale and location i have found repeatedly that an empathetic interaction is one of the is one of the critical ways of developing better mechanisms for dealing with a complex or chaotic future and I think that the, uh, an emphasis on, on empathy and on kindness really does push back against the, um, against the problems arising from the anxiety inducing elements of a chaotic world, of a banny world. Um, the other two that I've been working with as a way of thinking through you know, how do we respond, uh, improvisation and intuition. Uh, improvisation is, in many respects, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the term fluid intelligence, but uh, the best, one of the best definitions of it that I've seen is how you know what to do when you don't know what to do. That is, in a situation you don't have a, prep, a prepared plan for, in a situation you don't know everything about, how do you deal with it? You know, there's an old line from some of the futurists I used to work with, the future is uncertain and yet we must act. Well, the world is uncertain around us, the world is chaotic around us, and we have to act, what do we do? Improvisational skills are precisely those skills that allow you to think on your feet and recognize how the world is responding to your actions and responding and re your actions can then respond in kind or in turn. Intuition is really hard to define, but is that the gut sense of the, uh, of trying to, trying to understand what's going on. You know, just the, I can't really follow the, all the rules here because that will lead me to a pathological outcome. Or I'm, I, I'm seeing bits and pieces here that I can't really give a log, make a logical conclusion or problematic, but I just have a strong feeling that this is a problem. And the example I use when I give talks about this is Stanislav Petrov, who was a Soviet air defense soldier back in the 1980s. And um, some of you may recall, some of you, oh, a few of you may be old enough to remember Korean Airlines flight 007 that was shot down over the uh, uh, Yakutsk Peninsula, over, shot down over the, the Pacific edge of the Soviet Union. 
claimed the Soviets claimed that it was a spy plane, but it was a an, a jet airline for a, a jet airline plane. It was one of the the tensest moments of the Reagan administration, you know, the the nineteen eighties, the the depth of that part of the Cold War, and just a couple of weeks after that. Stanislav Petrov, working his radar station, his radar installation, got an alert of five incoming ICBMs from the United States. And right there on his radar, right there on his screen, they pop up. Here are five incoming nuclear nuclear weapons from the U.S. Yeah, he knew that if he were to follow his protocol, follow the rules of what he should do, he sends this alert up the chain even though he figures it's probably not real, but he sends the alert up the chain and there's a very high likelihood that the mechanisms of response would lead to a massive retaliation and global thermonuclear war. And he thought, and he said, yeah, this doesn't feel right. You know, if the US were to attack, they'd certainly use more than five weapons, right? It had, he had a gut sense that this wasn't an attack. And so he didn't send that up, send the message up the chain. And of course, within, within a short time, you know, a few minutes or, or an hour, it was clearly a uh, computer glitch. Now, Petrov was reprimanded for not following protocol, uh, but not arrested or anything really severe. But he, and he died a few years ago, you know, living off in, in a nice village in Siberia, I think. But you know, the point here is that here's somebody who listened to their gut, listened to their intuition, and managed to avoid plunging the world into global thermonuclear war. So uh, yeah, oh, nice, Michael, thank you for putting up the link. Um, so intuition, but the intuition was really hard to define. It's really hard to um, structure in a way that they oh, practice your intuition or anything like that. <sighs> so this is what has been rattling around through my skull, uh, trying to give language to the chaos that we feel as well as articulate ways to respond to chaos that lead to a better future. Because for me, the, my core desire my core belief is the need to make the planet, make the world better for the next generations, to leave the world better than, than I found it, to be a good ancestor. Um, I'm blanking on... Um, uh, Jonas Salk was the person who, used that, who coined that term, you know, to, to be a good ancestor. And... Um, so I've been giving, giving a lot of talks on that. I, I wrote it when I wrote about it, then tossed it up on Medium, got a little bit of attention, and then a lot, uh, quite a bit more, and then a lot more. And I just found out about a month ago that there's an entire academic symposium being run in Sri Lanka on the Bani model. Uh, I just gave a talk to 3,000 people, you know, literally yesterday, 3,000 people in Brazil uh, on Bani as a way of looking at leadership. Uh, it, it's just been, it's been a phenomenon that I fully, totally did not expect for it to turn out like that. You know, I thought I was coming up with a language that I could use with my, you know, fellow futurists, you know, in California. And it turns out that it's, that it's speaking to people in a way, you know, giving them a language, giving folks, especially in Latin America, but now I'm seeing a lot from South Asia, uh, actually quite a bit in uh, former Soviet republics, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly. And it, to give them a language for articulating, to, to reify, really, to give, to make, actually give, make them, allow them to structure what they see around them, to articulate the chaos. And it's been pretty remarkable. And I'm kind of overwhelmed by it. So, Peter. Very cool. Yeah, it's definitely a term that I'm putting in my conceptual uh, toolkit. And I'm going to use it often. 
and I actually found out about it from Anna Angelic, who was at the store yesterday. She's a branding uh, person. Um, she uses it, and the term seems to be definitely spreading. Um, so we have some questions in the chat. Feel free to put some uh, questions if you have any. Uh, I'll warm you up with one question. Um, so the Daniel Schmachterberger quote comes to mind. Uh, if we have, if we gain the power of gods without the wisdom of gods, uh, we self-destruct. Um, and then there's something about like wisdom. Uh, uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on wisdom. Maybe it falls into the fluid intelligence uh, bucket, but I'm curious about like being aware of Banny, like both conceptually and, and then viscerally so that then you can match like this kind of free floating anxiety to like what's happening uh, as a potential forcing function towards uh, becoming wise and us potentially becoming collectively wise. Um, so I'm curious uh, your thoughts on that. Um. Well, I will fully embrace the concept that you know, the idea that Benny, that embracing Benny will make you wise, um, which I know is not exactly what you said, but uh, you mentioned Deus Ex Machina, and I worked a lot um, 25 years ago with Stuart Brand, and in his, you know, the first Whole Earth catalog that he edited, you know, one of his concepts was, we are as gods, and we may as well get good at it. And if you take it, you know, you move aside the notion that, um, you know, the arrogance, the implied arrogance of that statement, what he's actually saying is, are, we have the power of, you know, that people in centuries past would have considered godlike. We have the capacity to do things that, even in 1968, things that were unprecedented and unimaginable for past generations. And there's a responsibility that goes along with the with that power. So I, I don't think a, it was a with great um, we are as gods and may as well get good at it was a statement of arrogance. It was a statement of humility. It was that version of with great power must also come great responsibility. And so when I think about Banny, when I think about the chaos in the world, what I'm in part what I'm seeing is the expression of our power without being good or good at it, or as you know, as Peter employed, an expression of our power without our, without wisdom. And while I haven't been using that particular language in my discussions of Benny, it certainly fits. You know, both the um, both in in the operational aspects of how, what do you do with Benny, but also in that broader sense of thinking about um, how do we use this articulation of a chaotic world as a platform for figuring out what to do about it. And so, yeah, I, I do think that there is a connection between, um, between Benny and efforts to gain wisdom. I don't know how well that works. Uh, I would, I would love to hear more about it from other people. In fact, all of this, all this Benny stuff, I would love to hear more about from other people because I'm, you know, going by the seat of my pants here with a lot of this, you know, I'm basing it on the work that I've been doing, but it's only been 25 years. Uh, I have, there's a lot of work that needs to be done before this, before any of this really makes sense. Mm. And just a, a quick follow up on that is a statement. It feels like the when it comes to wisdom, like the highest leverage component of the Banny is the anxiety. So it feels like it's the most human component. So my intuition says there might be some gateway towards wisdom if uh, we get into right relationship with this anxiety piece. Um, I, I would not disagree. Uh, so let's uh, take some people in. Uh, Lore, you had a question. Sure, it's um, a pretty generalized question. Hi, Jame. Nice to see you. Um, so I'm just curious because it feels like I, at least for me, I go kind of back and forth on this, like, yes, like if we figure this out, we can do something different. And, oh, we're like passing laws against um, green energy. Like, 
so how do you how likely is it in your mind that we can actually have enough awareness to make changes that will end up leading to our uh, you know maintaining a human flourishing direction as opposed to um, what the alternatives are well I think I will paraphrase Winston Churchill's description of the United States that it will do the right thing when it has exhausted all other options. And I think we will eventually do the right thing after we have tried all of the wrong things. I, I have hope, but I don't have faith. I have hope in humanity because I know we know what to do. We have all the tools, we have all the technologies we need, we have all of the models we need to resolve some major global catastrophic problems. And so because we, have, we know what to do, I still have some hope that we will eventually do it. But for a while, I've, re I've referred to myself as a long-term optimist, short-term pessimist. And I realized last year that at this point, I don't think I'm going to live to see the optimist part. That the, pes the short-term pessimist has now become a short and medium-term pessimist. Uh, do I think, you know, I, I do think that we will eventually figure it out. But a lot of people are going to be in real pain along the way. And, that, and that's the thing that is most angering, you know, rage inducing and sorrow inducing for me is just this recognition of that so many people will be hurt by, by the bad choices of the institutions of power. The institutions that have been in power, the institutions are in power now. So many people will be hurt, killed, um, devastated by these choices before we, we as a planet finally get around to doing the right thing the right thing is possible it's just not convenient any uh, follow-up question or share or um i guess everyone here has probably read the ministry for the future but maybe that's kind of what you're getting at yeah, I've had some long conversations with um, Stan Robinson about a lot of these things. And, you know, it's that I think we have a parallel sense that this is, yeah, this, the solutions are within our grasp, but they're just so hard to do, not technically, but politically, because we have for centuries built up concentrations of power, power and wealth, but wealth is translated into power that are loath to, to give up any of that power, who refuse to you know, give up a penny of it or a Newton of it um, to, and, and so we, have, we will struggle to pull that power and wealth from them. You know, maybe some, will, some of them will happily cooperate, but I don't think we have too many good examples of people with a lot of power and wealth who would happily cooperate right now. If you have someone that you know of, I'd, I'd love to meet them. Do you, uh, Laura? <laughs> I'm, I'm curious too. <laughs> um. I think, um, you know, where we intersect is that it's my thesis, I guess, that where we can put our energy is really in getting people to support each other, accept each other, have conversations, and that we're not going to win by trying to outpower the powerful. Right. No, I, I agree with you 100%. All right. Um, Yuri, you had a question. Yeah, so like if we think of the bunny world as complex or chaotic where like complex could be a human organism or like an ecology 
like a forest or something like that and chaotic would be something completely unpredictable like i don't know the world um <laughs> so i uh, i i reckon that the distinction between these two is uh like not part of the Benny framework, but uh, for a reason. And also, like, do you relate to these two in a different way? So, like, how do you relate to the complex and how to the chaotic? Um, yes, to both. Both of those questions. It is intentionally not part of the Benny framework because it is part of the VUCA framework. And trying to draw a clear distinction between the two, I've been I avoid. For the most part using the word complex not because i think it doesn't fit so much as i think it can cause some confusion for people who are already familiar with vuca uh, complex systems like like ecosystems can have chaotic elements uh, i think that where the core difference lies is you, you mentioned you said the word unpredictable and i think that's actually part of it that one of the aspects of a chaotic environment is the uh, how much even a slight change of the initial initial conditions can lead to wildly radically different outcomes. And that's not necessarily the case with complex environments. Complex environments often can fold back into themselves and reinforce themselves. And so where I was pushing when in the initial articulation of Bandy, you know, in this in the framework of chaos versus anarchy, was in that aspect of you know, unpredictability. That a lot of the fear that, okay, the example and one example is um, Kim Jong Un, his behavior, especially in the early days of the Trump administration, where it seemed like he was happily getting along with uh, with the president, and. It freaked out a lot of political scientists who focused on Korea, not because they were afraid of him cooperating with Trump or anything like that, but because it was so out of character. It was not what their what their experience had predicted or had expected him to do. And so when it turns out it was all a big troll, that there was great relief, not because, again, not because, oh yeah, well, North Korea should have all the nukes it wants, but because okay, this fits with how we understood his behavior. And so that a situation where the outcomes in the world run counter to our expectations, where they are incomprehensible, that for me is, you know, part of, it really underscores the difference between a chaotic and a complex environment. I think a, a complex environment, I know this is not, this is not, um, fully in line with the language around complexity, but it feels like a complex environment is more understandable, at least in parts, than a chaotic environment can be. And so, you know, that's why I, you know, threw incomprehensible into the mix that it really, this sense of, I don't know what's gonna happen next. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, you look back at the, at the, the specialists and the pundits just, in in early February this year, claiming that Putin's just making noise, he's not going to actually invade Ukraine. Okay, what was the? Now, obviously, that was wrong. Where did that chaos come from? You know, there is a lot of there's still a great deal of of um, incomprehension. A lack of comprehension of why Putin is behaving like this, why Russia is behaving like this, and I think we see that we see uh, incomprehensibility, especially at that global political level. And I suspect a lot of it's driven by fear, uh, and it's not just a it's not so much a fear of a powerful enemy, but a fear of change that cannot yet be articulated that we the combination of you know the climate emergency and the emerging powers of you know, what we're seeing with artificial intelligence and the how readily um, our sense of reality can be manipulated through our various network media and 
the uh, you know just you sort of go down the list of the fairly radical fundamental changes underway across the spectrum of our world and experience. And I think that the fear of that can afflict the powerful just as much as uh, those of us living amongst the rubble. And in fact, it may even be more, it may afflict them even harder because they, you know, they look at this and they see with all of their power, they don't know what to do. Um, and I'm sort of going off on a weird tangent, but it's, I, I see this as being a component of a lot of the, um, a lot of the complex issues that we wrestle with as a society is this, you know, there is, there are fundamental changes underway for which we have no good language, um, for which we don't truly understand. You know, we are still relying on you know, economic concepts and models that came out of the 19th century, the 18th and 19th century. You know, why isn't there a good 20, uh, 21st century articulation of how the global economy works? Uh, we are beholden to these legacy means. Um, I saw once saw somebody describing tradition as peer pressure from the dead. And I think we all feel a lot of that, you know, especially around our, you know, the way we think. You know, we have these legacy ideas that have been, that we had been taught were correct. Or that had essentially, we've been, we function as if we assume they are correct enough that are becoming less and less viable without something to replace them. You know, a lot of futurists use what they call the two curve model, where you have a declining curve of one particular industry or institution or concept, and then a rising curve. And the businesses have to decide when to jump from the first curve to the second curve. Yeah, it's really great consulting language, but what happens when that rising curve isn't there, but the declining curve is still declining? You know, and that for in many cases, I think that it, this is a big part of the chaos we're in right now is that we have these declining, collapsing systems without functional or recognizable alternatives, or at least not, not alternatives that are widely or even, or even in limited fashion recognized. I'm sure, I am certain that there are ideas out there. I'm certain there are people who are pounding their desks or pounding their heads about how come nobody's listening. But I'm not hearing them yet. And I'd love, I'd love for this to happen, you know, these changes to happen. So one thing that, one of the things about being a futurist these days is the incredible desire to be wrong. Uh, uh, most of the futurists that I work with today have a desperate desire to be wrong about their forecasts because the forecasts are so abysmal. All of the, the forces, his, futurists are basically anticipatory historians. You, you look at, at modern historiography, the kinds, of, the, the kinds of dynamics that are studied by historians about how we got to where we are today, what are the combination of forces, of de demographics and environment, and you know, go down the list of things that, that affect where we are today and play them forward. Play those same, you know, that, those same lenses forward. And that's what you're doing as a futurist. And right now, all of that historiography anticipatory historiography is pointing to some really terrible outcomes. I so want to be wrong about all of this stuff. I so want to be wrong about all this stuff. Simply because if I'm right or even close to right, it's going to be horrible for people that I care about. I mean, I'm old. I'm, I just turned 56. You know, I only have a, a couple of good years left in me. Um, and, uh, but I have nieces and nephews and grandnieces and grandnephews that I don't want to see them living in a terrible world. And that's where they're going. And I feel really bad about that. I'm sorry that I've turned this into a therapy session. 
Any uh, follow-up question to share? Um, the thought that occurred to me is like, so the the anxiousness that happens and the fear that like people who have power also have just like everybody else, like uh, that that also feeds into the complexity or the chaos of the world, right? So so we have to take that fear into account and like the incom incomprehensibility of the people who are acting in the world and who don't know what to do as like the thing that also influences. Banny is a perpetual motion machine. You know, basically all of the things that all of the aspects, the, the manifestations of anxiety, of incomprehensibility, of brittleness end up making the Banny environment even more chaotic and even more powerful. And figuring out how to break that. How do we break Banny? You know, where is the curve that we can leap to? I, mean, I wish Banny is... was brittle. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm right there with you, man. <laughs> I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm gonna have to write that down and seal that. Sorry, um, but you know, this is that. The remember my description of anxiety is not knowing what to do because you have no good options, and that's what a lot of the world. A lot of our situation in the world feels like right now is that where are the good options? Where are the right choices instead of the least bad choices? And when the least bad isn't really hit that much, that much less than the worst bad. Um, yeah, sorry. Other questions? Thank you. You're right. Thank you. Um, Brendan, did you have a question to share? Uh, Yes. Well, you know, this sounds what you're saying saying sounds a bit similar to the left side of the Kinevin framework graphic. You may have seen it where it starts with, you know, uh, simple or clear, and then it moves to uh, complicated and then complex, which VUCA sounds uh, complex, right? And even though you said you're avoiding using that terminology well, no, but then I, i'm using it because vuca does complex is one of the is the c in vuca yeah yeah and uh then banny see you know you're, you're talking about chaos here you know and what's what i wanted to was wondering is to what extent you would see you know that vuca would would be something that would come with a, like an emerging practice that's what's one thing that stands out to me on this graphic here is this emerging practice for complex whereas for chaos it's more of a novel practice like we don't even have anything to go on here as, as you were saying before intuition so to what extent you would maybe agree or disagree for what, whatever reason <laughs> well i fully agree no I, I actually i have not seen that graph so if you have can toss a link into the chat i'd love to uh, yeah i did above but i'll do it again here just moment yeah miss that fling by all right um thank you let me check that right now that's a rather elaborate graph um <laughs> rather uh complex complicated chaos and simple so what is what's the origin of this framework i, I can share the the screen so just if no one else is uh complex, complicated, chaotic, and simple. And this is uh, um, Dave Snowden's uh, uh, framework who does applied complexity. Dave Snowden, okay, that Sinophon. Okay, now, now I'm making the link in my head. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's pronounced Kinevin, I think. Kinevin? Okay, well, that's, a, that's the, it's pronounced but, GIF as far as I'm concerned. Um, Douglas, it's good to see you. I, I met Douglas back at the global, at global Business Network back in the mid '90s. So I do have a thought. Oh, good. Uh, first, it's okay to fail. Uh, we're all going to fail ultimately anyway, so the timing is just in question. Uh, <laughs> and I like the laughter; I think it's helpful. I think of the old phrase uh, "sweep the temple." You know, when in doubt just clean things up. 
if we worked on cleaning the environment intellectually and physically, it creates the best conditions for people to actually cope with this if something is possible, which we don't know. But meanwhile, let's just clean up everything. I'm okay. I'll get my vacuum. Um, it gives us so, something but, to do that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's a you know, that's a wise thought, Douglas. Um, you know, it's this. I think one of the one of the issues that has plagued me around VUCA is the is that sense that nobody's listening. How come we can't do something about this? And you know, wanting wanting uh, B Banny to be. I say VUCA. One of the things that's plagued me around Banny. Um, is the sense of of um, not knowing what to do, feeling I don't say panicked, but well, feeling the anxiety of it. And part of you know what goes into talking about this for me is to really is to really understand how other people are responding to this, because I can't live in my head so much about it. I need to understand and listen to how other people are hearing this, what is making them think about the world, and to whatever extent it does, how it makes them rethink their behavior. Um, so I think sweeping the temple, that actually makes a lot of sense for me right now. Thank you, Doug. So um, we're going to uh, gently close out here. Um, any, any parting words you'd like to leave us with today, maybe where we can find um, your work and, and other projects you're up to? We're doomed. We're all doomed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'm... So aside from the banished stuff, I actually do a lot of work around um, scenario creation, where I take a, you know, a set of inputs around what's happening in the world or what you know, questions a, an organization might have about the future and create multiple different visions of you know, a diversity of visions of what the future could hold, you know, coming from the, the an agreed upon understanding of the present moment and playing that forward in that kind of anticipatory history manner. And so that's actually most of my paid work right now, aside from giving big talks, uh, it comes from the creation of these scenarios. And I'm doing it mostly with the Institute for the Future. And I've just been doing a round with them for a couple of really interesting projects. You know, one is the um, California 100 project, looking at a, a set of scenarios up to 100 years out for the state of California. And that's been really interesting to think through, not just you know, 10 years out, but 30 years out and 50 years out. And then the other is for the United Nations Development Project, you know, looking at scenarios around uh, ethics and emerging technologies. And so it's, in many ways, I have just a truly wonderful job being able to imagine these futures and articulate them in ways that other people can listen to and respond to and build along with me. And so, I can't let the Banny part of it um, get me too down. And um, it is a, I, I do, but at the same time, I welcome the opportunity to talk about this with, with people far smarter and wiser than myself, um, because I think there's something useful that can be made. And, you know, like I, like I said uh, to Lar earlier, I don't have a lot of faith, but I have, I do have hope. And if we had more time, that would be my question about what the ex risk scholars call existential hope. Uh, and it feels like yeah, there we go. aware of this stuff, the more it's like you need to have that, uh, uh, that hope. Um, well, I'll put the, your links on the, the, uh, the video description for those who are watching, but uh, and I'll make some closing announcement in a moment. Uh, but thank you so much for coming to the Stoa today and uh, sharing your your lovely model, uh, which uh, um, 
spreading for a good reason. And uh, Monday uh, on April 25th, we have another event on suffering risks. So if you're familiar with the X risks, existential risks, suffering risks, this darker cousin. So more fun uh, at the STOA. You can uh, check that out at thestoa.ca. That being said, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the STOA today. Thank you. Thank you very much.